Welcome everybody to today's IMFE STEM Ambassador, a reminder about safeguarding and risk assessment training session. I'm Yelna Gatisha, the Education Outreach and Safeguarding Lead at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, and it is my pleasure to host the last of this year's IMECI STEM Ambassador trainings alongside Alexandra Knight from Stamazing. Before we start with the session, I need to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will be available thereafter on IMECI web pages available on demand. Um, before we begin, I would like to just cover a couple of items linking to the institution's wider objectives and then I'll pass on to Alexandra. So as many of you know, and many IMECI members volunteer their time and get involved in education outreach, promoting STEM subjects to the next generation. The institution's STEM ambassadors are representatives of the engineering profession and the institution. The way you present yourselves and deliver outreach is truly important and has the potential to impact a young person's life. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers Education Strategy focuses on facilitating the inspiration and retention of young people in engineering and promoting the value of engineering to society across educational activity. Our STEM ambassadors are a valued asset of the institution and key to the achievement of these important strategic objectives. The aim of these training sessions is to upskill existing STEM ambassadors, as well as to encourage others to consider the role. Therefore, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight that these trainings are available for all IMECI members, whether they're already registered as STEM ambassadors or members considering getting involved in outreach. Today's session is the fourth of a five-part webinar training series that the institution will be providing freely on a monthly basis to its membership through to January 2022. We plan to continue the training in 2023 and we will be releasing dates shortly for that. Each training will look at a different element of outreach and involve a practical STEM activity which Alexandra will walk you through. To highlight, each session is different and as mentioned, the content is available thereafter on our Mickey web pages. Now I will pass on to Alexandra, who will get started with today's training session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you. Hope that you are having a, a fun December so far. Um, I've been one of the unlucky ones up in Northumberland with no power for 11 days. So uh, I'm not in my usual office, but we will still, I'm sure, have a fun session today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can go through a couple of slides initially. Um, as before, really keen that we make this interactive and that if you have any comments, please put them in the chat um, or put your digital hand up and we can come to you uh, for any comments that you've got. Because particularly on this session, so the first half of the session where we're gonna talk about risk assessment and safeguarding as a bit of a reminder, a bit of a refresher for, for those elements of being a STEM ambassador. Um, I really, I don't want it to just be me like doing a lecture on that. I would really love to hear from you, your experience, how you manage it, you know, how you consider risk and safeguarding as part of your activities um, and just get kind of a bit of discussion going and, and so we can share experience that we all have. Um, and equally, if you don't have experience of that, then maybe sharing your questions and concerns, that would also be brilliant. And then in the second half of the session, we'll get on with a really fun STEM activity that, you know, you can basically turn into a bit of a game and is a great one to do around Christmas time. If you have any children or if you don't have children, just have some fun yourself with the other adults around because it's a really great one to do. OK, so <clears throat> for those who don't know me, I know in the chat we've had some people saying this is their first session. So for those that don't know me, I'm Alex Knight. Uh, I'm a chartered mechanical engineer myself and a fellow with the IMACE. And I worked in industry for quite a while before then setting up Stamazing, which is a social enterprise all around igniting inspiration and a kind of 
helping to kind of build that diversity and inclusion factor in STEM. And so I'm really pleased to be working with the IMECI to bring you these STEM ambassador training sessions. If you want to know anything more about Stamazing, you can check out my website, which is stamazinglimited.com. All right, so today we are going to be looking at as I said, a reminder about risk assessment and safeguarding. If you missed any of the previous sessions, so we've already done three of these, which all covered a different sort of learning topic about how to maximize your impact as a STEM ambassador and also to build your toolkit as a STEM ambassador. So if you missed any of those, you can watch them back on the iMechE website. And then we're gonna be doing another one in January as well. And what I will say at this point, actually, is look out for a survey that will be coming your way shortly, because it'd be great to get your feedback and think how we can improve, enhance um, future training sessions that we give you, because we want this free training to be really relevant and, and really help you. So it'd be so helpful if you could um, give us your thoughts in that survey, please. All right, so on to the, the first bit of the session. So um, STEM delivery risk assessment. So I'm really keen to know, first of all, before we sort of go into like the ins and outs of, of risk assessment and how you might wanna do it and some examples of that, what is your experience of this? So we've probably all got different levels of experience depending on the type of STEM activity that we would run with children. Um, so how have you even thought about risk um, before you've done your delivery, if you have at all? Um, what kind of risks should you be aware of? Um, how have you done a risk assessment if you've done one? What have you done with the output of that? You know, have you ever experienced an accident or an incident or anything like that might have come up in your risk assessment? Has any of that ever happened as part of your STEM that you've done? Um, so I'm keen to get your views on that. So please, if I open up the chat, um, feel free to put any comments at all relating to risk in, uh, in the chat that you've got experience of, or by all means, put your digital hand up because I'd love to hear from people personally. So please do share any experience you've got, whether you've done risk assessments for your STEM outreach that you've, you've done before or whether you haven't. Um, let's just get some, some, uh, some feedback from, from the room on your experience of that. So anyone wanna share? I'm sure we've got some STEM ambassadors in the room that have uh, done some, or at least got an idea of what they, either should do or have done before with uh, risk assessment. Or if, if nobody has done any risk assessment, that's also fine as well. Like, let us know. Do you think it's something you should be doing that you haven't been, that you've kind of missed out on? So while people are thinking about some things they can put in the chat from, ah, oh, there we go. I can see it coming through now. Uh, Kaki says, I personally have not done any, but I guess we should have. And Ellen said, I'm a girl guide leader, so I do risk assessments for activities like this quite often. If it's with a group um, I don't know or in a space I'm not familiar with, I find most leaders, teachers have something already, which makes a good starting point. That's great. So Ellen, it would be good to know from you, maybe you can come off mute. Um, that's great that you've got experience of that with with girl guides. So, do you have a structured risk assessment like process that you follow? Do you have a form you fill out, or what's your kind of process that you go through? Are you able to tell us? Um, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, I, we pretty much have a template that's ready to go, um, and we just fill it in, and it's. A pr pretty standard risk assessment really you go through you say a risk you say how severe it is how likely it is yeah. um we also have a couple of notes about just standing ones for different age groups like smaller kids need to be yeah. told about stuff like that a bit more than older kids tend to yeah. um yeah that's really yeah cool. it's just a template that i've got ready to go yeah great um because 
and, and I think actually having a template is a, is a really good thing. And some of us will have used it in our workplace. So like having a standard risk assessment template, something you can kind of borrow from work and, and use for this. Um, or maybe if, if certainly if you're part of Scouts or Girl Guides or, or other groups that do these kind of activities, they might have a template you can use. Um, Rohan has said, we've mostly assessed risk when planning the activity, looking at parts lift, activity steps, then identifying the dangers and swapping out props or steps where appropriate. Mm, okay, so yeah, so Rohan, have you actually, having done the risk assessment, have you actually then adapted or sort of tweaked the activity so it's got you to think about what you might need to change? Is that what you're saying in there? Are you able to unmute and let me know? Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, in a couple of activities that we've planned, we've gone in through and uh, where we've thought actually this part um, might not be suitable for certain ages or actually we're opening ourselves up to like some of the battery activities um, where we've we've got uh, dummy battery cells. We've thought actually let's let's use something plastic instead or um, some of the some of the dummy cells that we've had we thought actually no they wouldn't be appropriate to bring because of the weight or the shape or size so we've swapped those parts out for plastic or kind of like a replica yeah yeah and that's perfect because that is the whole point of doing a risk assessment it's not just a tick box exercise it's meant to help you think how could we do this better safer have better outcomes um, so that's really good to know that kind of thinking process of going through the risk assessment actually got you to think about, should we do something slightly different? Um, so that, that is really the whole point. That's great. Um, and Sarah Jane has said, I've done quite a lot in the past, normally created a formal risk assessment based on Swansea Uni template. I'm a teaching tutor and then create a plan based on that for the activity. So yeah, that's absolutely perfect. And Kelvin said, I haven't done any risk assessment as a requirement. Um, as a teacher are aware of STEM session, I assumed it's not a requirement, but I think it is important. Yeah. And I think, Kelvin, to be honest, I don't know that it is like mandated to do it. I think it's one of those things that, like I said, helps you think through what could potentially be a risk or a hazard. And therefore, if you've done STEM and haven't done it before, there's, you know, I wouldn't say that's like a really bad thing. It's just, this is probably best practice to help you thinking through to give you the best outcomes. So I wouldn't worry at all if you haven't done it in the past, just something to think about going forward. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, that's that's really, really useful. So continue to put your thoughts in the chat if you have any more thoughts on that as we go through. Um, so back to my slides. So what I was gonna share was, I don't know if that's covering your view, so I just get rid of that chat box. Um, so a bit of, I suppose, like the theory behind it, if you're not aware, like a lot of us are working in STEM or our engineers ourselves, so, tend to be quite on top of risk and risk assessment. Um, but just in case, like a quick recap. So really risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, right? And in ISO 31000, you've got a whole massive risk assessment process that you can go and follow that kind of thing if you really wanna get into the detail of it. I would say for what we're talking about with STEM outreach, you don't need to go into that level of depth Really, I think it's just a process to help you think through your activity in a bit more detail so that you can start to identify areas where you might want to tweak the activity or have a backup plan or a bit of contingency in there. And also maybe identify some positives as well, something you might want to enhance where there's an opportunity. Um, but if you think about the objectives, risks can only exist in relation to objectives. So it's useful to think, first of all, what is your objective for the session? And then what are the risks that might have an impact on you meeting those objectives? So obviously things like um, keeping the children safe, you know, 
Um, but also other objectives about your session, like you want them to maybe go away with a specific learning point or something that they've created. Um, and what are the risks that might impact on those objectives? So starting off with the objectives and thinking about the risks that might impact that from a health and safety perspective, but also a wider perspective of things like, I don't know, running out of resources or um, IT failure, things like that can help you plan a lot better for your session. I've just seen we've had a, another one come up there, Ellen, so give me peace of mind to, do, yeah, it gives me peace of mind to do one when, even when it's not required. If I've thought of safety and risk first and running a session, I can focus on delivering it well rather than realizing there's something I haven't thought of. That is exactly my view as well. It's peace of mind. It's a structured way of helping you think through your session. Um, and certainly like, you know, I'm a beaver leader as well. For the beavers, you have to do it. It's mandated before you run a beaver session. But going into a classroom, you don't have to turn up with a risk assessment to show the teacher. But if you've thought through it, you can have that conversation beforehand about how you might mitigate some of those risks. And some of the risks, like I said, won't be health and safety risks. They could just be risks to the impact of you meeting your objectives for the session. So Calvin has said, is resource planning part of risk assessment? Well, I would say you could consider that part of risk assessment. I'd be interested to see what other people think. But if you think about a risk to meeting your objective of the session is that you don't have sufficient resources, so how are you gonna manage that risk and make sure that you have what you need? Maybe you have a few spares, um, you know, you've got the right time um, for the session. So it helps you to think through basically all the elements of how you're gonna run that session, what you need, what might go wrong, um, and how you will plan to manage that. So I do think it's quite useful. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for all your comments coming through. That's brilliant. Um, and then if you look at a risk management process, identifying the risk and, and is kind of the first step there. So when we're thinking what, what could affect our objectives, then analyzing that. So again, this is kind of taking it to the next step of actually scoring those risks so that you if you've got a number of them you can focus on the top priority ones um, and then planning how you'll manage those monitoring them as you're actually doing the activity so like you know you might want to actually think how has that risk played out has my mitigation measure sufficiently managed that risk um, how you might respond if one of those risks does actually like manifest in the session so you might want to have some mitigation plans and maybe put those in place, for example, like having spare resources. Um, and then it goes around the loop. So you'll learn, you know, your experience will feed into your assessment of the risk for next time that you run that activity. So um, it's an ongoing process. And, you know, depending on the type of activity you're running, you may end up generating quite a few risks, or maybe it would just even just be one really simple one, you know, like the children getting paper cuts or something like that. It, it, it doesn't have to be anything um, too serious. I would say it's still worth thinking that through though. So you have got those, that option to put mitigation actions in place. And then I'm sure you're all kind of okay with this, but if not, the way to score a risk is that you look at its likelihood or its probability of happening. So how likely is that to happen? And then how bad the impact would be. So it's consequence or severity. And it's the combination of those that give you your risk score. And so those that are like really likely to happen and have a high consequence or severity obviously would then end up in that red zone. Um, and another important thing to mention is that risk kind of versus opportunity conversation, as I said before, risks can actually be positive. So something that might happen could have a positive impact on your objectives. So in a way, then you want to think, so how do I make that more likely to happen that you end up having a really positive outcome? Like the children, um, I don't know, 
uh, asking you more questions? How do you give them the opportunity to ask more questions? How do you give them the space to optimize their design and get into kind of some fun space of just really uh, making their design unique and individual? How do you give them that space and time in your session? So that could be something that might or might not happen, but you want it to happen. So how do you make it more likely to happen? So does that make sense? It's kind of looking at risk as um, also potentially an opportunity. And um, we've had another comment from Sarah saying, my resources are part of my risk assessment, but more in minimizing the risk of tripping over cables, selecting child safe equipment, child friendly conductive carbon inks for making printed electronics. Wow, that sounds awesome. Yes, um, that's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So risks associated with your resources as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you, Sarah. And you could also think of that as well, like if, you know, if you're going into an unknown space, giving yourself the time to do a quick risk assessment of the space, what could potentially be a hazard? Are there cables for IT equipment that, you know, children might trip over if you're getting them to move around the place, for example? So in your risk assessment, you might want to give yourself an extra five minutes to do uh, like a hazard check of the room. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you for those comments. And then um, I'm, oh, there we go, sorry, just looking at those. I'm giving you here, this is one that I use, and I know like you probably have different ones that you might use at work or we use as part of the guides or scouts. Um, you can find these example risk assessment uh, sort of templates on the internet as well. But just a really uh, like basic, because I try and keep it simple um, for what we do and it's amazing. So you've got probability of impact, so high, medium, low likelihood, and try and sort of qualify that by saying it's more than 70% likely or between 30 and 70 or less than 30% likely. Um, and then consequence, so that's the severity, again, just high, medium, low, and try and actually quantify it with a bit of a description. So actually high risk would be something like the child actually gets hurt um, or, there's, or there's some like property damage at the school, for example, medium being there may be a minor injury or like something, you know, that requires some intervention like a cut or something. Um, and then a low risk could be that actually nobody gets hurt, but what you're trying to show them doesn't work. And then it means it doesn't have the impact you want because that still impacts on your objectives of the session. And then you can so think about those in advance. And then if you want to score them, which you don't have to do, you might just wanna think through that process. But if you do wanna score them, this is kind of like a standard risk assessment template that we use where you've got the risk title, the risk description, what the cause of that risk is, the impact of that risk, and then you've got your scoring of probability um, and severity, the combined score of those. And then if you want to, you could then think about your mitigation measures and then rescore it so that you can see after you've mitigated the risk, is there still gonna be a residual risk there? And what's the key things you have to focus on? And so, you know, at the moment, like I'm going into, go, starting to go back into schools and do STEM sessions. And we have to be aware of COVID, obviously. So that's one of the risks you would put on the risk assessment and how you're gonna manage that. Okay, does that make sense? Let's go back to the chat. Um, any any uh, other comments or questions or anything you've got around risk assessment? I think it's one of those things that it's not rocket science. It's quite simple to do in a way, um, but you just need to kind of think about it. Okay, yeah, we've got a hand raised. Yeah, Al Razi. Feel free to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks for an interesting uh, webinar. Uh, there seems to be quite a few confusion regarding risk versus hazard, uh, because um, as we know from uh, HSE, one needs to identify first the hazards and then based on that, what are the risk levels? So um, in your risk assessment is all based on risk, no mentioning of hazards. 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, but I think, you know, from a very structured perspective, like from the HSE, looking at hazards and risks, like absolutely, you, you can do that as well. For me, I've kind of, I've lumped it all into one, I suppose. So I'm looking at what are potential hazards in terms of health and safety and what are potential risks. But if, you know, really it's up to, you because there isn't no there's no like mandated approach for this so if you want to bring your experience and best practice from what you're used to then that is fantastic and if you've got any advice on how you would recommend that's done for the other stem ambassadors then more than happy for you to to you to share that no perfect uh, perfect no just uh, we used to do it the hazard way and then what are the risks associated with the hazard and then based on that you you propose a control measure uh, but as you said, it's it's uh, it's simplified for a STEM activity, I suppose, uh, which I think uh, should work. But uh, each activity has its own hazards and then its own risks, which then requires certain control measures. Yeah. Um, I think uh, no, that's clarified. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank okay. And then we also wanted to touch on safeguarding. So again, anybody got any uh, comments, questions? around safeguarding in particular. So you would have seen in my risk assessment there, safeguarding, I, I included safeguarding in, in that risk assessment. Um, but it, I think the reason why I've pulled it out as a separate topic is that it is a really important part of our role as a STEM ambassador. We have a duty of care to the children or, or vulnerable adults that we're engaging with. Um, and so that's an important part for us to be, you know, mindful of in how we're interacting with them. So has anyone got anything they want to share on safeguarding, um, how they've managed it or resources they use to help or anything like that? I'll leave. I know particularly like if you are a registered STEM ambassador with STEM learning, then they have got quite a lot of resources available to help with an understanding of safeguarding um, and kind of how you can make sure that you are doing what you need to do as a STEM ambassador to, to make sure that you are um, safeguarding any vulnerable people, which is of course children, but also vulnerable adults as well. Um, so I wanna just, cover you know really when you look into um the the sort of standards around safeguarding the key things that it's saying as stem ambassadors what we must do um sorry ellen's just put in the chat there which is really useful i always say whenever in doubt share any concerns you have with groups teacher or leader they will have their own procedures for managing any safeguarding risks yeah absolutely so thinking about it in advance and having a conversation about it in advance to make sure that everybody's clear and that there are no safeguarding risks around. Um, so ultimately it's coming to ensuring children and vulnerable people are safe, protection from maltreatment, preventing impairment of health and development and taking action required to ensure that they have the best outcomes. So children, vulnerable um, adults have the best outcomes and um i would say it it's just an extra thing to add into your risk um, assessment process make sure you're considering safeguarding and the key things for us uh, i would say is, is our behavior obviously that it's appropriate for the age group that we are interacting with our language that that's appropriate for the age group we're interacting with Obviously, it goes without saying not to, um, you know, any element of sort of making young people feel bad that they've like done something wrong, you know, shaming them in any way is obviously a no, no, um, your what you're wearing. So making sure that what you're wearing is appropriate. Um, it's for you know, relevant to face to face and online. So making sure that if you're online, what's in your background is appropriate for the age group that you're interacting with. Um, photo consent, making sure that you don't take any photos or images or screenshots of children without consent. Um, I think I've thought about everything. If there's anything else that I've missed, feel free to put it in the chat 
um, there. But so there's a kind of, you know, it's more, it's common sense, but it's just thinking through these points and making sure you're checking in with yourself that everything is appropriate for the age group that you're interacting with. And as I said, have a look at um, stem.org.uk. If you just put in the search bar for safeguarding, you'll get um, like a one pager, which is kind of like a safeguarding statement, which helps with the key points. And there are training materials as well that you can get. So there's lots of extra resources there if, if you want to um, look into that. Okay, brilliant. So just to kind of recap, this isn't something that should put you off in any way for doing STEM outreach. It's there to ensure that you have a successful STEM session. Um, just, you know, it can be a light touch, but just think in advance about potential hazards or risks and how you will manage them in advance of your STEM session. So what might you do differently or what do you wanna have a conversation with the teacher or leader of that group with, as, um, as was said in the chat. Um, be aware of your safeguarding responsibility as a STEM ambassador and speak to Yelena at the IMECE or your local STEM ambassador hub if you have any questions or concerns about that at all. Super, okay, any more, any questions from anybody? Um, anything else that you want to add before we move on to the next part of the session, doing our activity? So anything coming up in the chat? No? So hopefully that is reasonably clear. And like I said, I definitely don't wanna, it's not something that should be scary and put you off, but it's one of those things that it's just useful as a reminder to um, make sure that you are considering with your STEM sessions. Fantastic, okay. So onto our next bit where we, as, it, as with the previous sessions, we split these sessions half half. And so the second half being a practical bit that hopefully if you've got some of the resources, you can join in with us to make our, uh, our cork launcher. And I'm also gonna add on a sort of a simplified version of that that I run with much with quite young children. Um, but as with all of these, check out the iMechE STEM at home webpage. There are so many useful and, and amazing resources on there. This one is a great activity to talk to the children about energy, projectiles, motion, energy transfer. Um, and it's, it's a really fun one as well because you can make it into a game. And that you've got your video tutorial, you've got the worksheet, which has got everything you need and, you know, including key STEM messages if you want a bit of extra kind of, um, I suppose, like confidence in the kind of STEM facts you can talk about and, and key STEM learning points that you'd want to try and get across in the meeting and the STEM language around the activity as well. Right. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can come back and, sh and we can get into actually doing some of the activity. So give me a thumbs up in the chat. Anybody who's got some of the resources that you'll be able to follow along with us. So see, we, see if we've got anybody who's actually going to be joining in with us. So I know kind of what kind of pace to go at. Give me a thumbs up if anyone's got any of the resources. So the things that we said we wanted were a cardboard tube. And what they say in the I'm a key one is that they want quite a big one, um, which is some, something like this, like a Pringles tube is ideal. Um, a bottle, and you want the bottle to be able to fit inside the tube. So bear that in mind when you're looking at sizes. Um, some elastic bands and these quite big ones because they've got to stretch pretty much the length of your cardboard tube. So you need some quite big elastic bands. Um, and then some sellotape, scissors, a pencil. Um, and I think that is it. Oh, obviously a cork because that's what we're going to be launching. Uh, Got a few of those around this time of year. Um, so, and then if you want to make the game where you end up knocking over some like pins essentially, then you can have some uh, paper cups as well or anything you could use to make some, some kind of target that you could knock down. Okay, I've just seen in the chat, so Mohammed has said, after completing five sessions as training, 
Will we be given opportunities by the IMECI or will we have to find ourselves? Oh, okay, so Mohammed, do you mean in terms of opportunities to go and do STEM outreach in schools? So actually linking you up with schools, is that what you mean? If you're able to come off mute, that would be really good. Yes, working with children. Elena, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, I was thinking it might be useful, so I'll just jump in. Um, generally, we recommend that you research local schools, anything that's of particular interest to you that is sort of um, accessible. And if you have any existing links to schools, um, to get in touch with them primarily as the sort of first point of call. The Ameki doesn't get involved in every sort of outreach activity as you can imagine there's we have a lot of ambassadors going out across the country what we try and do is provide you with the training and the resources to enable you to do that um, there will be institution-led activities and we have partners that we work with such as amazing such as primary engineer uh, to name a few and there are specific opportunities there as well as that, we have the IMECI Student Challenge portfolio. There are opportunities to get involved in volunteering uh, across, across that. But my suggestion would be that you try and do something locally because it's more likely that you will establish an ongoing relationship. It'll be easy for you to get to. And it's sort of that personal touch um, and to build that relationship, because I think the most meaningful interactions are the ones that are sort of kept up on, on a long term basis. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's that's great. Thanks, Elena. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mohammed. Thanks for that question. Um, and I, I can't remember if Jelena, if Elena said this, but um, your local STEM ambassador hub will also be able to advertise loads of local STEM outreach opportunities, everything from going in to do an activity with primary school children through to going to a careers fair at a secondary school and everything in between. So yeah, there, there's plenty of opportunities out there for you to get involved. All right, so we're back to our little uh, cork launcher activity. So with your cardboard tube, if you have any of these like around Christmas time and you've been eating your Pringles, then what you want to do, because we need it to be a tube open at both ends, you've got to get some scissors and cut this end off so that it's a tube. And that can be a little bit tricky to do with scissors. So something for the risk assessment, if you're doing it with, with children, is to be safe and careful with the scissors when you are cutting that metal end off. Um, so here's one I've done earlier and cut that off. And then what we want to do with this is we want to create slits where we can then put our elastic bands on to hold our elastic bands in place. So nice and easy, get our scissors and cut down one of the open ends and just do a slit, a double slit there so that you can see that. Can you see that there? So I've done a double slit that side there. And depending on how big your elastic band is, you, you want to be able to stretch your elastic band from the base of that slit to the other end of the tube. So you cut a slit that side and then do the same on the other side using your scissors to cut a slit down there. So that's quite nice and simple to do. And then we want to attach our elastic band and put it over that slit so that it's at the end there and do the same on the other side. Now I'm gonna show you a trick if you don't have long enough elastic bands for a long tube like this. What you can do is take another elastic band and just quite simply loop it through the end of this one so that you create a longer piece of elastic. Right, so I'll just show you again. All I did was just put that through there and grab the other side of the elastic band so that you just connect the two together with a simple knot there. Okay, so I've managed to make my elastic bands a bit longer there. And then we wanna stop the elastic bands from coming out. So you wanna put masking tape or sellotape 
around the top here. And if this ends up being a little bit rough, where you've cut it, a bit of a jaggedy edge, then try and put the masking tape over the top as well, so that we make that a smooth edge. And we get a bit of sellotape and put that over that slit there so these elastic bands can't come back out again. Do the same on this side. Okay. All right, so now we've got the first part of our sort of launcher system. And then we take our plastic bottle. Remember I said it's got to be able to fit inside your tube. And to, we want to be able to put a pencil through our plastic bottle so that that creates a bit of a stopper at the end when the bottle goes in. Um, so you need to create two holes in the side of your plastic bottle which again, something for the risk assessment, you can either use scissors to create the hole, or if you've got a skewer in the video, it shows you, it shows making a skewer and then actually using the pencil itself to make that skewer hole a bit bigger. So once you've made your hole in there carefully, you can push your pencil through there and it, you need to do it quite far up to one end of the bottle. So I'm doing it kind of around the shoulder bit of the bottle there. Yeah, so you've got that in there and that's gonna create a bit of a stopper for us. And then you wanna be able to put your bottle inside one end of the tube on the opposite side of your uh, elastic bands. And then you pull your elastic bands each side over the pencil there. So this is like our stopper going in and also allows us to connect the elastic bands to that end. And that is it, you've created your launcher. So you can pull that back and then you can launch out from that end, whatever projectile you choose to put in there. And so we, it talks about using a cork. The cork is quite good because it's got that little bit extra momentum compared to say using a marshmallow or something that means you can actually then knock over those paper cups that you've stacked up so you can talk to the children about energy so in here because we've got the elastic bands as we stretch them we are storing potential energy in the elastic and then as we let it go that's converting into kinetic energy and we'll launch our projectile out and you could talk about different angles of trajectory and and you know ask the children how they might make the uh whatever they're launching go higher or further um and of course to get creative you could decorate around the outside of this tube so before you even make a start uh with doing the slits and things you could wrap a piece of a4 paper around there and get the children to decorate it and make it unique to them so let's just do a test, see if this works. We've got that, there we go. Ooh. So that launched our cork. And of course, if you've got your paper cups lined up, which could have numbers on the inside or underneath so that you can get a score of how many you've knocked over. So this one, I mean, it's nice and simple. I love it because it's, it's simple, but also, really fun and you know you can basically leave them to be getting on with this so they can do that a lot of the activity quite independently there are a few extra risks involved because of needing to use scissors to kind of get through plastic and cut the end off there so I'm just going to quickly show you one that I use with very young children for to be able to have a similar conversation about learning points and all you need for that is the inside of a toilet roll and a balloon and your sellotape again and your scissors, okay? And for this one, really nice and simple, we have, you can decorate this cardboard tube. So again, you could wrap some paper around it, do some decoration on that or paint or, you know, mark a pen directly onto this toilet roll tube. And then with the balloon, again, we're doing the same thing. We're storing potential energy in our balloon, in the kind of rubber in the material. We're not going to blow the balloon up, just going to leave the balloon uninflated and tie a knot in the end of the balloon. 
So if he is very young children, you might need to give them a hand with tying a knot in the end there of the balloon, but get a knot in the end of that balloon there. And then once you've got a knot in the end, then we're just gonna use our scissors to cut about halfway along that balloon, All right? So you just cut the tip of your balloon off. And this is a good one to do over Christmas if you've got any young children around. So get them to carefully cut the top of that balloon off. And I'll angle my camera so you can see. And with this, we're now just gonna stretch that bit of the open balloon over the bottom, the bottom of your toilet roll tube and then use some sellotape to go around that. Put that down so that you are nice and securely sticking the cut bit of that balloon around there so that it doesn't come off. Give it a bit of a test, make sure that it doesn't come off. And then we've essentially just created very similar um, you know, very similar outcome in terms of it will be able to launch something like, I'll tell you what we could do, a little bit of paper, take a bit of paper, screw it up into a ball. I normally do this one with say marshmallows, mini marshmallows or something. And then, oh, that went super high. So you can launch all sorts of fun things from this really, really simple device. And again, Talk about the same things, energy transfer, motion, how you have to transfer, you know, something needs a force before it's going to move. Otherwise it will stay still or stay at its, its constant speed. So you can talk about motion. You can talk about energy transfer. You can talk about projectiles, um, all sorts of things you can start to talk about when you have either of these devices. I'd say this one is for slightly older children, this one you can go down to very young children with. And of course, making it as we do with all these, trying to make it into some kind of fun competition, see who can launch something the furthest, um, you know, get them to think about different types of projectiles, test those, which ones go further, which ones go higher. With my children, they were launching marshmallows and seeing if they, how many they could get into a bowl um, you know, in like 30 seconds. Um, so quite a fun one to do with young children and get them decorating that. Brilliant. So anyone, uh, I don't think anyone had the resources to do it with us, did they today? Or did anyone manage to follow along with us at home? Or is anyone going to plan to do this one over the Christmas holidays, either themselves or uh, with some children? Tony said, I made one. Yay. Which one did you make, Tony? So I made the Pringles tube. Excellent. How did it go? Uh, it's here if you'd like to see it. Yes, please show us. Um, hang on. Are you going to enable me or? Oh, can you not oh, turn your camera on? Yeah, here we go. Hey. Ah. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. And I'll fire it at you. <laughs> no way. I'm safeguarding. <laughs> I risk, risk assess not to do that. <laughs> but yes, the difficult thing was making the holes in the bottle, actually. Yes, yeah. The, and I had scissors, um, mm -hmm. but, they, but that didn't work. I had to get a knife to do that. But otherwise, okay. I'll fire it upwards. Eee, okay. That works. Brilliant. Thank Super. You. Yeah, agreed. Like, I think actually having done that one myself as well with the scissors and then poking. And because my bottle was quite thin there at the edge where I poked through, so it was a bit easier. Um, but still scissors was a bit of a challenge. So I would say next time having a skewer and then using the pencil to widen out that hole would yeah. be much better. Um, but brilliant, well done, Tony. Anyone else managed to follow along and make one or planning on doing it as a fun Christmas activity? Let's, let us know in the chat if you think that one's, I think it's, it's really easy to do and, and really good fun. So. It's an excellent one to do. And if you get download the iMechE resources and it'll give you more ideas of things you can talk about with the children. Um, and yeah, I think the other thing it talks about in the video actually is rather than stacking cups up like this and making a tower like this, it talks about sellotaping 
them together like this to essentially make a little pin, um, you know, something that you might like a bowling pin. And then that could be another thing they can do and they could decorate the cups as well. So you could make it quite um, a good length session. I think we had somebody, somebody was about to say something then. Was there anybody else who wants to make a comment about the activity at all? Anyone ever tried this one before with in a STEM session? Cool, hopefully you will have some fun with that over the Christmas period. Ah, oh, Helen, unfortunately I'm in the office so can't stop firing corks all over the place, but I'll definitely try and do this with my range unit. They love anything that goes bang. Yeah, agreed, brilliant. Um, Calvin said the second one made me smile. I will try this Christmas. Yay. Awesome. Great. Well, I hope you all um, enjoyed that. And, you know, you can see how simple it is to do a practical activity like that with children um, and especially ones that just require resources that are quite basic resources that you could ask the teacher in advance to ask the children to collect and bring in. Um, so that you know you don't have to get 30 of them but yeah it's it's nice and easy stuff fantastic thank you everybody Yelena did you want to say any closing words at all no I just wanted to say I mean I think you've covered it anyway but most of the activities on our stem at home range are um easy easy items easy materials that you'll have mostly obviously some of the more complex ones you will have to look through the kit list but the other ones they're easy to source and most of them are reusable and generally it's um quite easy to get the class to prepare um so I think that's what I wanted to say. And the other bit was about the, the training session. So I'm just piping up now. I hope you don't mind. Um, yeah. We'll be running more training sessions next year. Um, we'll send out or I'll be sending out a feedback form. So please let us know your thoughts, what you'd like to hear about more, um, what worked well, what didn't. And so we can keep doing this type of thing. And I hope you find it useful. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate your comments and your engagement um hope everybody has a fantastic christmas holiday yeah. and you get a bit of a break and i look forward to seeing you for the next one in january yes thank you thank you everybody have a lovely christmas